Good morning. Welcome to Emmanuel Christian Reformed Church live stream service. Thank you for joining us on this, well, cloudy Sunday, but thank you for joining us all the same. Today we come together to worship the Lord, to praise the Lord, to seek the Lord in adoration and intercession. So please join us this day in worship with a beginning call of worship, a call and response call of worship. Let's join together. Come, people of God, let us offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and lift up his name in the presence of his people. For God is gracious and merciful, full of compassion and love, while we were still lost and to save us. The Lord came to save us, and this is something that we should give praise for, glory for. So let's come together now for a prayer of adoration, opening our hearts to praise the Lord in the deepest place within us. Please join me in a prayer. O Lord, who covers us in grace, in mercy, in love, like the clouds covering the land, we praise you and adore you for the wonders, for the family, for the breath, for the mystery that you have given, the mystery and life that we have in Christ Jesus, who makes us a living people. We praise you, O Lord, for this day. We praise you, O Lord, for what was done 2,000 years ago. We praise you for what is to come. O Lord, hallelujah. May you fill our hearts this hour with the Holy Spirit, that we may know your presence, your wonder, that we may give you true songs of glory. Be with us now, O Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. So let's come together now to sing those songs of glory. Let's sing together. Let us sing. Good morning. In Psalms 8, David said, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? What a comfort it is to know that this big, big God who created planets and the stars is in is wanting a love relationship with us, his creation. And with that, no accomplishment that we have here um, can surpass his great big accomplishments. And also in, in that same thought, no problem we have is too small nor too big for our great God. That is a comfort as we come before God today Let's declare how awesome, how majestic he is. Forgiven 
is great, truly great, and to show our praise to the Lord, to witness how great he is, we as a community always obey the Lord. He said, do this in remembrance of me when he took the cup and the bread. And today is Communion Sunday, where we remember what he gave us, of how great he is. And on Communion Sunday, we recite the Apostles' Creed, a baptismal creed that tells us those essentials of the faith that unite all Christians. So please hear the question and respond, the Apostles' Creed, together. Here's the question. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into Hades, and the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, life everlasting. Amen. We believe in the forgiveness of sins. We believe the Lord does wonders. And so as the people of God, we come to the Lord humble, confessing our sins, asking to be forgiven, and asking the Lord to show mercy to the world, to bring healing to the world, to hear those who are crying and oppressed. So please join me in this call and response prayer of confession and intercession with a moment of silence at the end. Let us pray. We are beings made of flesh, but also of spirit. We ask you, King of creation, forgive us for our greed and covetedness. We have been shameful, letting our appetite and egos rule us, not the spirit of love and faith. Lord Jesus, forgive us for going against the cross. And may the church remember the wisdom of the cross, the hope of the empty tomb, May we bear witness to the victory in Christ, being a people who serve to fill others with God's blessings. Hear our prayer of confession, O Lord, and hear our calls for help, for our needs, for our loved ones' needs, and for the world that seems stuck in a maze of sin. Lord, have mercy. And now a time of silent prayer. Pray that your sins may be removed and pray for the world and others in need. A silent prayer. And now, as a people of God, we remember that prayer, that precious prayer that Jesus taught us. We remember the Lord's Prayer and say it together. Let us say it. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord is willing, and the Lord forgives us. So let's sing songs of renewal. Let us sing together. Let us sing.
Son of God, the Father's gift to us. You alone were broken on the altar of love, precious Lamb, our freedom sent your blood. Great love is worthy of giving great thanks. And we at Emmanuel are a community that give thanks. We give thanks with our prayers, with our time, with our relationships, and our offering. So do know that Emmanuel is still a community that gives through their offering. We come together pulling our resources so that other people can know the great love of God. You can give by coming to the church any day of the week, and you can come and put your offering in our offering boxes with a prayer. But also know that we are a community that also knows how to give through an e-transfer, through electronic means. So please go to the church website to learn how you can give through an e-transfer. And now, as a community, as a thankful community, please join me in this prayer of thanksgiving. Let us pray. Thank you, O Lord. For those who are close to us, for our loved ones, for our children, for our spouses, for our friends, for our parents, for our siblings. Thank you, O Lord, for the gift of people's lives. And thank you, O Lord, for your gift, the relationship that we have with you, that mystical, wonderful, mysterious, and life-giving relationship that we have in Christ Jesus. You came down to heaven to be with us and you lift us up into heaven to be with the Father forever. We thank you, O Lord. We thank you for hearing our prayers. We thank you, Lord, for getting us through the week. And we thank you, O Lord, for this hour and time of worship. Please, O Lord, be with those who are in need. May you receive from us our offerings. May they be used by your Spirit. May they be used, O Lord, by the Church to proclaim the gospel of Christ that other people may know 
that we should give thanks to the Lord. Lord, we pray and ask that you do wonders. In Jesus' name, amen. And now we come to the community portion of our bulletin. And now we take time to pass the peace of Christ, because we are still a united community. Be those in the sanctuary, you to remind people and embolden them that we at Emmanuel are a church with a mission. We do not just come together through the screen on one Sunday, but we are meant to go out in the world, go out to people and share the gospel, to be God's hands in the world. And so we have a mission statement that we're going to try to create a practice in saying to remind us for the rest of the week that we are a mission-given people. So please respond. and for the sharing of the gospel. So if you're interested in joining, uh, contact me or Hector, and we'll get you connected to the uh, Google Meet uh, chat group. But if you'd rather just have a prayer request, do know that you can email prayers at icrc.ca and send in your prayer requests, and we will, as a community, pray for you. Also know that we have a new edition of the Daily Office Guide. It's available. It's uh, got a, a Bible reading plan in it. You're able to uh, look at the Bible scripture of the day, read it, and also have a morning and evening prayer, which helps that keeping practice of praying. So you can pick up your copy here at the church or a digital one at the church website. Uh, baptismal classes are still open for registration. Uh, we're hoping to do the baptisms in November, but we need people to say they want it so that we can schedule everything and maybe keep the social distancing in place. So please, go on the church website pick up the uh, forms and send it into the membership uh, email so that we can get you registered for a baptismal class. We have children and adult. And finally, I mentioned before that today is Communion Sunday, and for many of us, we've been picking up at the church these little tiny plastic cups filled with juice and a little, little wafer. You're able to come to the church on a weekday and take a mac. Also, some prayer requests. AGM is coming up. Pray for our AGM meeting. Um, pray for our community, for protection from the COVID virus, and for the future education for our Sunday school. We're trying to think of how we could do Sunday school in the next coming months, so please pray about that, that that could be a possibility. And now with that all said, let's come together at a time of message, a time of message with Pastor David. Thank you. So thank you, team, for your uh, uh, leading us into uh, musical worship uh, for today. 
Um, I think some of us may know that uh, Brother Ronald, who is the brother-in-law of our elder Hector, has been struggling with illness, COVID, and then afterwards some complications. And uh, some time ago today, uh, he just passed away. His name is Ronald, so we would like specially to pray for Ronald's family at this time. Let's pray. We come before you, dear Lord, because you are the giver of life, and you are the giver of eternal life. We have been praying for Brother Ronald for a while. We thank you, Lord, for your care over him because we believe you always give what is best to us and to him. We thank you, Lord, for walking with us as we learn to pray, as we again rediscovered our helplessness and your compassion. And we believe, Lord, that you have drawn Ronald unto yourself at this time to end his early suffering. We pray for the family. We pray for special comfort from above. We pray for the peace of Jesus Christ. We pray for the consolation that comes from the Holy Spirit. We thank you for words of comfort uttered by God's people and relatives and loved ones. We pray, Lord, that you watch over the family. And at this point, Lord, we come before you to receive from you your word and pray that you speak to us, that we hear only you and no other voice. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Well, we have been studying the book of Philippians, and today we're in chapter 3. Philippians has only four chapters, so we are coming to a close very soon. But today, we're in chapter 3 and looking at verse 1 to 21. This part can be divided into three subparts. That's verse 1 to 4, 18 to 21, which connects naturally. And then there's verses 4 to 11, and then verses 12 to 17. The Word of God is given to the people of God, written by selected members of God's community, inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that what we actually hear is the very Word of God. And that is why as a church, we are very attentive to the very words of Scripture, and we want to study the Scripture systematically, one portion at a time, because the Holy Bible contains God's will for us doctrinally and also ethically. It means what we should believe and how we should live. And that is why we gave a lot of importance to expository preaching, which means you draw out the meaning from the text. We don't bring in other ideology into the text, but we let the text come out and speak to us. Let's look at the first portion of this part. Paul, writing to the people of God in ancient Philippi, says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh, for it is we who are the circumcision, who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. Now, you and I know that when Paul was in Philippi or Philippi, he was persecuted. He had a very bad experience there, but he was not discouraged. Of course, the Philippian Christians themselves were persecuted because they have turned from their local gods and goddesses to the God who created the heavens and the earth and His Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. They were being persecuted at that time, 
And Paul told them to rejoice amidst hard times, to rejoice in the face of persecution. The word rejoice or be glad or joy, these are connected words, actually occurred in the book of Philippians 12 times. Many times in chapter 1, many times in chapters 2 and 3, many times in chapter 4, every chapter he talks about joy or rejoicing. And of course, he says rejoice in the Lord. If we do not rejoice in the Lord, it is difficult to rejoice steadily and permanently. Paul says despite adverse circumstances, despite your hurt feelings, despite the losses you have suffered for the gospel of the Lord, you can still rejoice because you have found something far beyond what you have lost. And he will pick up again the theme of loss and gain later on in this chapter. Paul says, I'm writing to you old things. These are not new stuffs. I have already told them this. You already knew these things, but you know what? I'm writing them again, and it's okay for me. No trouble. Why? For your own safeguard, for your own safety. Sunday school teacher comes into the class and announces to the class, today we are looking at a story from the Bible about a little shepherd boy fighting a giant. And the class started to respond. We already know the story. We have heard the story. We don't want this story. Can you tell us something else? There are two ways to go. The first is for the Sunday school teacher to say, okay, since you have learned that, why don't I tell you another story from the Bible? That's one way to go. But the teacher took another route. A teacher says, wow, it's great that you have heard the story of David and Goliath. You know what? Can you tell me the story? And the students tried as a group. Many mistakes. Many errors. So the teacher says, wow, that's great that you know the story. Now let me tell it to you again. Corrections were made. What happened there? There was the collapse of memory. Not all of it, partial. There was recovery. There was correction. There was review. There was better remembering done. Yes, sometimes it's like that. Oh, I already know that, we thought. But maybe we don't remember everything. Maybe parts here and there. It is wise to review. It is very important to review. That's why you do it before an exam. That's why you do it before an, a job interview. You review things because they are important things. Paul is saying here, this is very important for your safety. So I will repeat. Yes, may we learn to value repetition and remembering correctly and completely. It is very useful, a skill in life. It's also very useful for us as we study God's Word. Paul says, it's no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. And then Paul says something very strange for us people today. Paul says, be careful, watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil those mutilators of the flesh. What does it mean, those dogs, those evildoers? Well, Paul lived in the first century, we in the 21st. That's a big gap. Paul lived in the Middle Eastern world. We live in the West. Well, that's a big geographical gap. You know, that's how they speak in his culture. If you go to another part of the Bible, it will become very clear. Thank you. 
human way. Yes, religions are like that. They're either human ways or Christ the way. Some rely upon the flesh, what I can do, what I have achieved, what I intend to do, my goodwill. And Paul is saying, no, we rely upon the Christ, what He has done, His good accomplishment, His love, his goodwill. And then with regards to worship, Paul says, we worship by the Holy Spirit. If you look at the structure of this line, it's exactly the same as what was used in the Gospel of John chapter 4 when the Lord says, we must worship in spirit and in truth. And here it's worship by the Spirit. Same construction. When it says worship in spirit and truth, guess who's the spirit? Some people interpret it subjectively. In spirit means you're very sincere. So if you're sincere, you can worship God. Well, in the Bible, the spirit is a person. It's not subjective. It's something very objective. You can't change him. He is the third person of the Holy Trinity. In spirit and in truth, truth is a body of doctrines. Truth is something we memorize, we understand, we remember. That mechanical? No. Jesus in the end, I mean afterwards in the Gospel of John says, actually, you know what? I am the way and the truth and the life. It's the same thing. If you want to worship God, you have to worship the Lord through Christ by the Holy Spirit, in spirit and in truth. And then, here we find the Holy Spirit as involved in our worship. Well, the Bible talks about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Jesus told His disciples, wait here for not many days after you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Yes, John baptized with water, but Christ baptized with the Holy Spirit. And indeed, afterwards, the Holy Spirit came and they started to preach the gospel. And in Romans, we are told, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you don't belong to Him. It's necessary. So the day you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're baptized with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is given to you. Now, there's another part in the Bible that talks about the Holy Spirit indwelling. When Paul told Timothy to defend the deposit or the faith given to him, he says, by the Holy Spirit who lives in you for the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit indwells, stays within the Christian. Even clearer is from the book of Ephesians. Paul saying, having believed, speaking to believers, 
you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. From the day we believe the Holy Spirit comes, indwells, until that day when redemption is completed, we are justified, we are sanctified, and then glorified as we have studied the last time. Until that time, the Holy Spirit indwells. And then there's another part in the Bible that says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be drunk or be filled with wine means wine takes over, control you, and suddenly you behave unnaturally. It says, let the Holy Spirit take charge of you. Filling of the Holy Spirit. Peter denied the Lord Jesus Christ three times because he does not have the courage. But when he was filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts, he spoke to the Jewish leaders who put Jesus to death or instigated the plan that made it happen. And Peter d looked directly at them, filled with the Holy Spirit, and says, we cannot do what you're telling us to do, not to preach in Jesus' name, because we would rather obey God than men. Suddenly, full of courage, because he was filled by the Holy Spirit. What does it mean? Filled by the Holy Spirit means the Holy Spirit takes full control. We are no longer directing ourselves. Our sinful nature is no longer directing ourselves. Our personal desires and ambitions and dreams are no longer directing us, but the Holy Spirit is directing us. Filling of the Holy Spirit. At the same time, the Bible tells us that we should not grieve the Holy Spirit or make Him sad. And of course, that refers to a Christian who is not filled with the Holy Spirit, but led by selfish or sinful desires. And it makes the Spirit sad. It grieves the Holy Spirit. So these are four of the works of the Holy Spirit. There are other works that the Holy Spirit does, like inspiring, illuminating with regards to Bible, Scripture, truth, etc. But we look at these four because this four is very close to us. You're baptized by the Holy Spirit. You're given the Holy Spirit or baptized with the Holy Spirit once and for all in your life. It does not have to be repeated. Number two, the Holy Spirit indwells us, and that's something continuous in life. It doesn't just start on the day you accepted Christ and then stop the next day, 24-hour effect. No, it goes on until the day of redemption. And then the feeling of the Holy Spirit can happen on and off. When we let the Spirit take charge, then this is when we are filled. And then when we're, our weakness uh, comes in, and we kind of set the Holy Spirit guidance aside, then we grieve the Holy Spirit. It can be on and off as well. This too struggle. Either you're filled or you're grieving the Holy Spirit. It happens on and off in real Christian life. These are the works of the Holy Spirit. And Paul is saying when we worship, which one is it? Yeah, the second and the third. The Holy Spirit indwells us and draws us to the cross and to the God who sent His Son. And then in worship, you want to be filled by the Spirit. Do you notice that if you are very troubled by other things coming into worship, somehow you're physically there, but you just cannot fully worship because these things are directing our attention now and then here and there. But when the Holy Spirit takes charge, He guides us towards the glorious vision of the cross, the glorious vision of the majestic God. As we sang today, majesty, majesty. The song summons us to attend, to focus our eyes upon the majesty of the Almighty. What a beautiful song that was that we sang earlier. And then Paul goes on in verse 18, he says, For as I have often told you before, and now again say uh, uh, with tears, many live as, wow, this is a heavy word, enemies of the cross of Christ. For their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, their glory is their shame, their mind is on earthly things. 
their glory, it means what they are proud of, what they boast about, is in their shame. Of course, that's another way of saying that they are very proud of their sinful deeds. No? Because the Bible says when we sin, we are shamed before God. We are in shame. We don't glorify God, but we shame ourselves. So they glory in sin, and we do see that in real life today. Some people are proud of what they do, even though it's not uh, a morally right thing to do. And then their God, their number one is what? Their stomach. Yes, here we find Paul saying that human ways rely upon the flesh. And human ways, not just one, many human ways, is basically worshiping the self. The stomach is a word for the self. And then, with regards to the cross, they are resistors. They don't want it. So they're enemies of the cross. And then going on, Paul says, but our citizenship is in heaven. We eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control will transform our lowly bodies, this body, so that they will be like His glorious body, from the lowly to the glorious. What is Paul saying here? He's saying that our bodies are destined for destruction and shame. But you know what? You can change the course by calling upon the cross because the cross will divert you, divert your course to the way of glorification. And that is why Paul says, we rely upon Christ. We boast in the cross of Christ. With regards to the cross, we do not consider it something bad for us, like enemies, but something good for us, like glory. So this is the first part. Paul is trying to draw a picture of the human ways in contrast to Christ the way. So how do we deal with the enemies of the cross? A friend of mine who's a seminary teacher, like I was, and we were in a vehicle going to the seminary, and we conversed, and he says he uh, came back from America, and he was a bit disappointed. And this is shortly after 9-1-1, September 11, the falling of the uh, Twin Towers in New York. And then he says he was very bothered. I said, why? He says, because uh, when I went back to, to the U.S. and spoke to the people, uh, and everybody was talking about 911 because it was a big event, very recent. And you know what they said? I said, what? He says, they said we should go and bomb them, bomb the Arabs. That's what they were saying. I says, and what did you say? He says, well, I say we go and evangelize them. They need the gospel of peace. They need the gospel of salvation. Wow, yeah. What this seminary teacher who was a missionary was saying is, remember what Christ said? They say, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. Well, I say, no. You love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. That's what we do. We love the enemies of the cross. It will not unmake them as an enemy of the cross right away. It might. But do pray for them and love them as well. Because they're also human beings made in the image of God. They're also looking for truth, ultimate reality, ultimate meaning. They need to find the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether it's your personal enemies or the enemies of the gospel, Christ's teaching applies. Love your enemy. Pray for your enemy. But what about when they start to attack Christ? What about when they start to destroy the work of Christ? What do we do? Many years ago, I was visiting a place, and the Christians complained to me that there is another religious establishment, another religious center that was built. They bought a big chunk of a mountain and built a massive compound there. And they were doing their vacation program, which outshines 
our church, vacation, Bible school, and so forth and so on. So this is a big problem for us. So what should we do? So I said, can I go and see? So they brought me to the place. I visited the place, and then I talked to uh, the people in charge and uh, learned the name. They learned my name. We conversed, and they gave me a lot of materials that they are using for their uh, work there. We must love people. And then going back, the, Christian told me, the Christians told me, so what do we do? I say maybe we should pray that they close down. What? Yeah. Maybe we should pray that they close down because they're not drawing people to Christ. They're drawing people away from Christ. We did not pray that the officers will be sick. We did not pray that. We just prayed that that work should stop. And we prayed for more than one year. And guess what? The place closed down. I went back to the place. It's all deserted. Still beautiful, but it's dusty now. It closed down. You know why we do that? Because prayer is very often warfare. The Bible tells us that Satan is like a roaring lion looking for somebody to devour. And he does not stop. He keeps doing that. You need to pray against the works of darkness. But you must pray that people come to Christ and we must love all of them because they have a soul as precious as yours and mine. That's what happened. The Lord one day may ask, did you resist the sinful schemes? We may say, well, there's no way we can win over that. So we did not. There's no chance. The Lord may say, well, I'm not asking that. I'm asking, did you resist? Yeah. Yeah. People use all kinds of mechanism to resist the gospel of Christ. Sometimes they use the law. They make laws. Sometimes they use regulations. Like in an institution, like a school or a hospital. They use all kinds of means. But the Bible tells us that we love and pray for the enemies of the cross. But we do resist their sinful schemes by prayer and by action. And that's very important. Prayer, action. Well, in verse 4 to 11, Paul talks about his former self and his current self. The former Paul and Christian Paul. If anyone thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrews of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, the number one most zealous people, uh, for zeal, persecuting the church, that's not just practicing my religion, but stopping those who are wrong. As for legalistic righteousness, I did everything. I was faultless. And, but whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish to be disposed, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Whatever was profit to me, Paul says, I now consider loss. Why? I found Christ. He outshines all of that. He reveals that all of these are rubbish. I, did not, I was living in rubbish for years. Now I got rid of them. In fact, Christ is so precious to me that I want to share in his sufferings. Wow, this is powerful language. Paul is saying, Christ suffered. I want to share in his sufferings. Wow. I want to suffer? Yeah, you can say that. Paul is saying, I want to have a part in his suffering. Yeah. You know what? In life, we all suffer. 
whether you follow Christ or not, whether you're religious or not, whether you believe God exists or not, we all suffer somehow. We suffer when we lose things. If you lose your phone, you suffer. You suffer peace of mind, you suffer discomfort, stress, all of that. And you suffer the loss of an object. If you lose money or investment, you suffer. You can't sleep at night. You want to think how to, you know, maybe go to court and recover the investment and so forth. We suffer in life. Paul is saying, I'm willing to suffer for Christ because it is worth it. The question is not how to have no sufferings at all, but whether our sufferings are worth it, whether our sufferings are meaningful. To suffer in jail for wrongdoing is not very meaningful. To suffer because you spoke the truth to the king and lose your head, like John the Baptist, may be more worthwhile, more meaningful, because you're speaking God's speech and you get executed for it. Paul is saying here, I want to share in Christ's suffering. These are things that are precious to us, these five on the screen. Number one, your house. That's where we go after a long day. That's where we go when it's raining too hard, when it's snowing too hard. It's the safest place for us. We don't want to lose our health and be always sick, rushing to the hospital all the time. We want people to say, hey, we like you, you're nice, you're okay, and to welcome us when we show up and smile and extend their hands and say, come on over. Social approval. We don't want to lose our freedom and be confined in a cell behind bars. We don't want to lose life. These are five things that many people have lost for Christ. House. Risma is from Sudan. She needed a job, so she went overseas to work. While overseas, she became a Christian. Then she became homesick. She wanted to go back to her family. So she flew from Jakarta, Indonesia, and went back to Sudan. And when she arrived there, of course, she's already a Christian, did not participate in traditional family religious rites. Very soon they observe, notice, and ask why. They learn that she has become a Christian. And she said, my mother, I quote, raged. It was a scandal. And she was told, if you don't give up your religion, you leave this house, you're no longer part of this house. So she left because she could not give up Christ. Some people offered their health on the altar of service. Epaphroditus got sick. We didn't get a chance to learn about him, but we look at Timothy, and he risked his life for the gospel. John Bunyan went to prison for preaching the gospel. He stayed there 12 years and wrote some great works. Social approval. Pastor John MacArthur was on Larry King Live, and he was asked, what is your take on this? And he recited the Bible, and he was very much disliked for that, including from the other panelists, but he stood his ground. Life. People lose their life for the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus asked Peter, do you love me more than all of this? Peter says, yes, Lord. And Jesus asked again. He says, yes, Lord. Jesus asked again. He says, yes, Lord. And then Jesus said, you know, when you're young, you go where you want, do what you want. But when you're old, they're going to take you where you don't want to go, put you where you don't want to be. The Bible says it was indicating the kind of death he will die. And the Bible adds, for the glory of God. It was a glorious death. That's what it means. Be glad when you suffer meaningfully, when you suffer for the Lord. Let's pray together before we come to communion. We thank you, Lord, for teaching us to love, not to hate. We thank you, Lord, for teaching us to rejoice and not to be demoralized. We thank you, Lord, for giving us your word. And your people come.
to the holy table. We ask, Lord, that you cover us with the blood of Christ, that we may receive the bread and the cup in a manner worthy of our precious Savior. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we come to the table of the Lord and we remember the words of institution. If you have your bread and cup with you, please ready it. We will receive the bread first. So at this time, if you can just open the top just to expose the bread and then to take it in your hand. On the night he was betrayed, the Lord took up the bread. He blessed it, then he broke it and says, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us receive the bread together. Now flip open the cup portion to about halfway. After supper, in the same way, he took the cup and said, This is my blood of the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us receive the cup together. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, our precious Savior, you shed your precious blood for us that we may be translated one day from our lowly bodies into the likeness of your glorious body. You are our Savior because of what you have done. We are blessed, most blessed. Thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. At this time, if we can all stand as we receive the benediction. May the Lord Christ, who gave himself for you, watch over you and protect you from the evil one. May the God Father above, who loved you and I so much, He gave His only Son, be with you and protect you emotionally, physically, spiritually, and mentally. And may the Holy Spirit, who indwells us and guides us, lead us into the will of the Father, that we may rejoice that we may love. Blessings are pronounced this day in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated at this time for a silent prayer.